This is Milad. He is 20 years old. He has translated for ISAF and US Army in Afghanistan. I don't want to talk about what happened to his hands, but I do want to mention that all he had in life were two older brothers who recently drowned in the Mediterranean. I'm his family now. This is Mila. This is Karar. He is also 20 years old and he is from Iraq. This kid is hilarious. He managed to make fun of some, of some ISIS members who were trying to recruit him in Baghdad, so they kidnapped him. And after many beatings and a large sum of ransom, he managed to escape, leaving everything behind. I'm his family now. Milad and Karar need our support and help in order to become citizens of equal opportunities and responsibilities. The current mechanism, the current integration mechanism in Europe has failed them. On one hand, there are no language and cultural acquisition courses for them to attend. There are no fitting or proper mental health and support services. And these kids are not even allowed to work. On the other hand, Youngsters and people like Milad and Karar are coming into Europe with little to no knowledge of the Western society, our values, our expectations and laws. We need a solution to this problem, a problem that has been defined as the largest catastrophe since World War II. We need a movement, a movement that I will coin as the European dream. And I believe that integration is the most important part of this dream. So what is integration? The Council of Europe defines integration as active participation in society on the basis of minimum standards of income, education, and accommodation, freedom of choice of religious and political beliefs, cultural and sexual affiliation within the framework of basic democratic rights and liberties. But I would rather take a simpler approach of saying that True integration is contribution. As you can imagine, integration is a very complex topic. In fact, it's almost like love, something we don't even know how to define anymore. So I came up with the idea to ask a few good friends of mine who know me well, whether they view me as integrated. Here are their responses. Laura from the US meant that, I see you're integrated in the extent that you have a job, can speak the language, and care about the community you currently live in. So Laura points out the importance of work, language, and social functioning. Another friend of mine from Denmark meant that you've integrated because you were given the opportunity to do, to do so on equal terms as your peers. Nikolai Svanifjord is pointing out the fact that uh, I was given the same opportunity as him, namely be a part of a United World College, a school that is attempting to unite the world. But we also learned it the hard way. Nikolai was my roommate in the first year, and uh, yeah, he is a very big guy. He's about 90 kilograms or more. He's, uh, you could call him a Viking muscle pack. Uh, but as according to his story, he couldn't sleep through the first night because he was afraid that I would kill him due to the newly drawn caricatures of Muhammad in Denmark. Another friend of mine, uh, Håkon Schoenheider from Norway, meant that you have integrated into the society but I also believe that you could have integrated better if the whole society had let you. Hokun is alluding towards a fact that is discrimination, and namely that if your name is Mirvais, you're less likely to be leading a bank and more likely to be randomly checked at an airport or a border. <laughs> In fact, he continues to find it funny, although he expressed it this way. Last time we went through Canada entering the US, he couldn't stop laughing at me because I was so afraid of entering through. <laughs> Another friend of mine, I actually uh, expected a positive answer from him, but this is what he meant. Uh, I wouldn't describe you as an Austrian. I would rather see you as an international human being who functions anywhere on this globe. Hall is uh, actually pointing out the importance of global citizenship, and he is pointing out that I am more of a global citizen than an actual Austrian or a person that belongs to a certain country. And lastly, Stipe Chavar from Croatia meant that you very promptly learn the ways, customs, and nature of the West, but to live it like, to live it like someone born into it, you never fully managed. 
CP is pointing out the importance that even though these people are coming in and um, living into these new societies, they also bring in some values from their past life. But you never know what to expect from Stipe. <laughs> Last we were together, it was uh, at an airport in Florida and I was randomly selected. So as soon as that happened, he smiled at me and said, what's up Taliban? <laughs> and I didn't even have a beard. <laughs> So why should we care? Why should Europe care? Why should we integrate uh, the people that, who have already arrived? Well, uh, there's two reasons as to why the refugees are an asset to Europe. First, it's the economy, stupid. In fact, uh, the refugees are good for economies. Um, there are a variety of uh, studies done by large and famous prominent organizations, including the OECD, the government of Canada and the Brookings Institution claiming that the refugees are good for economies. Experts actually have given five to six years time to Germany and uh, Canada, after which the, the refugees would contribute, positively contribute to the economies of the countries, if integrated rightly, which is a political bomb. Wait, wait, I know I said bomb, but uh, please don't leave. I haven't brought anything with me. Anyway, back to the point, uh, Canada and Germany were given about five to six years time after which the, the GDP of the country would profit from the refugees that have come in. So let's go back to where Karar and Milad used to live in a house of about 1,000 people. The Austrian government under the Austrian rules spends about 20 euros per person per day which makes it about 20,000 euros per day for the entire house. Uh, let us also imagine another world, a world in which the refugees are actually allowed to work instead of aimlessly sitting around and wasting their, wasting their time waiting for the government to make a decision about their life. Let us also think of the refugees as if uh, they were human beings like us, not too, not too different, so we generally do like an eight to four, eight to five job, which uh, uh, allows us to live like we do in the society today. So let us give the refugees about two to three hours of time to go to courses, learning the language and learning the cultures of the new places that they're in, uh, which leaves us with about at least five hours of free time per day. So now I can play God and decide what these young men or these people who have come in can do with their free time. Well, I would like to think of myself as a nice guy, so I'll just allow them to have a job instead of sitting around and drinking and smoking and learning to do things that people do in their free time when they're bored. So let us imagine that about 90% of those 1,000 people in that house are allowed to, uh, are able to work because they're over 18, the rest being children. And let us say that about 80% of those 900 people um, are actually willing to work or are able to find a job. And that would leave us with about 720 people. So now I have 720 people working, but um, as a political god, I would also want to make sure that my uh, population, my citizens are actually happy with my decisions. So I will pay the refugees less than the minimum wage. And let's imagine the, the minimum wage to be similar to the one in Austria, which is about eight euros per hour. I'll frame the refugees as volunteers to make it legal under international law so that they can actually be paid under the minimum wage. And I'll pay them, let's say, two euros less, which would be about six euros per hour. Now I'm still worried about my, my population, so pff, yeah, I'll just give them 5.5 to make my population even happier so the citizens don't bring in too much political heat for me. Now we have... Uh, 720 people making, not just making about the same amount of money that the government would otherwise spend. They're also given dignity. They're given something to do instead of aimlessly sitting around and waiting. Last time I had two weeks, 
after making a mistake, I had two weeks of just sitting at home and doing nothing. I drank about 19 liters of wine. <laughs> I read two books. I wrote, I wrote two chapters of my own book. I played uncounted hours of video games. I watched a TV show and almost killed myself twice. These people have been sitting within four walls with no entertainment and no money for months. What do you expect? So I'll suggest that we push our politicians who sometimes tend to have racist views in order to uh, benefit from the refugee population to focus on another problem that we have and that's a lot bigger than the actual refugees that are coming in. This is just an example, a comparison of how much money was spent on refugees and how much money was spent on bailing out the banks only in Germany. This is from last year, from 2015, and as you can see, about uh, 5 billion was spent on the refugees and just about 290 billion on the banks. If we increase the amount of money that's spent on refugees and make it twofold, which is by 100%, that makes about 10 billion, it's still 29 times less than what the banks cost us. So, uh, we also claim in Europe that we have learned from history. We are really proud to come up with that uh, argument that we have learned. But I believe that if we want to claim that we have learned from history, we also need to uh, acknowledge and respect the human rights that we promise to uphold. We can only learn from the picture on the left, but we still have the chance to play God and decide how the lives of the children on the right will be, humane or not. So I have come up with two arguments and these are the two main ways from my perspective that we can help in these, the refugees to integrate rightly into our societies. And first, as I mentioned, would be language and cultural acquisition. Now, I still don't feel entirely comfortable knowing that these new citizens of our societies understand the fact that my imaginary girlfriend likes to walk in, a, uh, sh in, a, in short clothes during the summer and that I actually don't believe in a God. And that's where the importance of laws and regulations comes in. We need to give these new citizens, these new people a chance to learn about the basic behavioral laws that we have here in the West in order for them to slowly but surely become a part of our society. The last question arises as to how we can help. We're here to step out of bonds and I thought that I, I would come up with a few ideas as to how we can help. Maybe you can show up your hands and tell me how many of you actually have smartphones and are connected to the internet. That's like probably almost all of you, if not all. Um, so you may also have heard that the refugees are actually uh, also connected to the internet and most of them have smartphones. So I came up with the idea to create an app called Contact where you could potentially get to know a refugee maybe even take them out for a coffee or even bring them for a family dinner if you'd like. And that way, uh, as according to psychology and the contact theory, it's more likely that you learn about the actual problem and, and that you share experiences and that you get to know the problem that has been defined as the biggest disaster we've had since the World War II. Another idea of mine was volunteering. I know uh, I know that you know that there is uh, a lot of uh, language and uh, cultural acquisition courses online for the refugees to take, but it, uh, it continues to be the case that uh, there is fewer and fewer volunteers in the, in the refugee camps that are available around Europe. So if you feel like you have free time and you want to contribute to this particular problem, you should just show up and maybe teach a language or get to know a few people in the camp, and that also helps. 
The next idea of mine was to actually start out a project where we would have uh, cafe houses around the biggest cities in Europe and in all the countries that actually have refugee populations, um, which would allow for space where you could, uh, people could meet uh, and greet and share experiences with refugees and with uh, other people from all over the country. Uh, that would also very much help with integration. But if any one of you uh, thinks like they would want to steal my idea, you should give me some credit at least. And lastly, uh, many, of, uh, many of our citizens, of European citizens, uh, are very busy. So I thought that we could start a petition for those who are unable to spend time outside of their work and their regular life and see how many of the 740 million people in Europe actually care about this issue. Um, I know people who are against it are really loud and politicians who are against it are really clear about their uh, view. And uh, most people feel helpless, but I believe that if even half of the European population actually decided to sign a petition, which would make about 300, what, uh, 360 million uh, uh, people who would be signing a petition, that would totally bring in a new perspective uh, on the politics of Europe, and that could definitely make a difference. I want to tell you one last story. This is Abdul Razek. I randomly met him at a refugee house in Austria. I had a really weird uh, feeling about this guy. I, when I saw him, it was just a deja vu moment, and I couldn't control my brain. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew that there was something more than just seeing a refugee. So I concentrated, uh, I went up to him, as the boss of the new house, and uh, and I asked him where he was from. So so he lied. He told me he was from Iran. Uh, I could read the fear in his face, just wondering who the hell this bearded guy is in a suit, asking weird questions. But I persisted. I continued uh, naming the country, uh, Afghanistan, a city, a region a school, the headmaster's name, teacher's names, and even name of students in a certain class. We were both shocked. Me and Abdul Razak were actually classmates 11 years ago. We couldn't even understand the situation. We couldn't manage to grasp the reality, the, the difference between lives and, and the stories. But that is really not important right now. What's important is that Abdul Razek has left a child of 11 months. He is being persecuted and he is a refugee. I refuse to live in a world that allows this. I believe that it is time for our generation to start a movement. I believe that we should start the European dream. Thank you.